Hello, I'm James Holland and I'm a historian of the Second World War. History Hit is a bit like Netflix, but purely for history. And we've got hundreds of hours of historical documentaries going all the way back to classical times, right through to the Cold War and beyond. Use the word war stories, all one word, for a massive discount when you join up. The incredible true story of the concentration camp that fought back. The fog of war that blights a whole generation. And a close encounter in the Canadian wilderness. A new kind of war. Conflict on a scale never seen before or since. This is war at its weirdest. Incredible experiments. This has got to be one of the most bizarre weapons ever mooted in the history of warfare. What is even crazier is that it seems to work. Mysterious events. This is brilliant. You couldn't make this up. Unexplained phenomena. This is all crazy, and I kind of don't even know where to begin with this. When a world goes to war with itself, things get really weird. When we envisage the Holocaust, we tend to think of hopeless compliance. Our predominant image of the Holocaust is of helpless victims being rounded up and slaughtered like cattle. But that can't always have been true. There must have been resistance and there must have been people that just said, no, I'm not having this, no, and made a stand. It's a little known fact, but some Jews did fight back. Some actually ended up killing their concentration camp guards and made their escape. This is the incredible story of the Jews who refused to die and the day they set fire to hell. September 1943. A shipment of Jewish POWs from the Red Army arrives at the sorting station of Sobibor concentration camp in eastern Poland. These Jewish prisoners of war are met off the train by what we're known as Sonderkommando. Now, these were camp inmates, Jews and other camp inmates, whose job was basically to do the filthy jobs inside the camps. They can't look them in the eye because what they've been sent there to do is assess everybody getting off the train and put them in two piles. Healthy, so you're going to be in the camp, and unhealthy, you're going straight through for a shower. But what they didn't know was the shower blocks were, of course, gas chambers. The Sonderkommando's work is not yet done. The Sonderkommando's aren't finished. They're required to go through all of the possessions that people have um, brought with them. Anything you can sell or anything you can use, you keep. They even have to go and extract all of the gold teeth from the victims as well, because the Nazis aren't going to let that go to waste. One thing the Sonderkommando took for themselves was any food that this new intake had had on them, because the Sonderkommando were starving like everybody else inside the camp. One of the inmates, Tovi Blatt, explained with bitterness and regret that they would often look forward to the arrivals of new prisoners because there would be more food coming into the camp and it was the only way they could survive. Unsurprisingly, there's huge conflict in feelings when you're taking food off a dead person. The Zonda commandos carry and guard this terrible secret that these facilities are death camps and they know that everybody in them, including themselves, will ultimately be murdered. It was a factory of killing and they knew perfectly well that their turn would come. But some of them refused to be cowed. Among that shipment of prisoners of war was a particular man, an officer called Lieutenant Alexander Pachersky. He was a noticeable character. He was about 35 years old, he was tall, he was proud, and he was prominent through his Red Army uniform. 
one other inmate in particular, Leon Feldhendler, notices him straight away. Now, Feldhendler was under commando. He was a man in his early mid-30s. He had been the chairman of the Jewish Council in a town called Julkevka before the war. He had actually organized an escape committee amongst the Zonda Commando. Characteristic of a good leader is to know when you're out of your depth, and Feldhendler knew that he was not a military man um, and that they would need a military man if they were to be successful in getting out of the camp. And for that reason, he took Bocheski aside, risked everything, really, by taking him into his confidence and let him into the dark secrets of Sobibor. Together, these two men organize the Sobibor Jewish underground and devise a daring plan to seize control of the death camp and free their fellow inmates. The plan was immensely risky. It would involve overpowering the 12 SS officers in charge of the camp and the 200 Ukrainian guards manning it. And then you had the fact that you needed to do this in total secrecy. Nobody could be trusted other than your own escape committee. Everyone was a potential informer unless you knew them intimately. The plan is an audacious one. It is timed to happen when the main commanders of the camp are away, leaving only a junior officer in charge. At 4 p.m. on the 14th of October, 1943, Tovey Blatt executes the plan. He approaches the acting camp commandant, Second Lieutenant Neiman, and suggests to him that he'd like to offer him some clothing that's been stolen from corpses. So he lures him to the uh, shed and instead of this coat, there's an axe, and he gets that in the face. Over the course of the afternoon, Blatt played the same trick on 10 of the 11 remaining officers. One by one, they came in. One by one, they were attacked. They were killed. They received an axe to the head. He's used their own greed to get at them, and to a man, they've fallen for it. One by one, they came in to take their reward, and one by one, they received their reward. Stage two of the plan is even more daring. So stage one, which was smacking all of the SS officers in the head with an ax one by one, is quite audacious. Stage two is even better. The accounts aren't particularly clear, but presumably they dressed themselves in the SS officers' uniforms. And after stealing six rifles, they gathered the 600 inmates on the main square of the camp. And their plan was simply to march them out of the front gate, right under the noses of the Ukrainian guards. But then, something goes wrong. Coming up. Bauer was a, a very brutal individual who was feared in the camp. He was nicknamed the Gasmeister because he used to personally operate the gas chambers. So he's a piece of work, and, and he happens to drive back in just as they're about to mount their attempt to escape. One young man had a spray tank and sprayed fire all over the fuel dump of the camp, setting the entire camp on fire. One inmate, as he was running, was shouting, Hell is burning. Hell is burning. As the inmates of Sobibor prepare to march out of the camp, an SS NCO named Bauer drives back into the compound unexpectedly. Bauer was a, a very brutal individual who was feared in the camp and timing of his return really couldn't have been worse. He was nicknamed the Gasmeister because he used to personally operate the gas chambers. He had kept two sex slaves, effectively, two Jewish actresses called Ruth and Gisela, and he had kept them uh, and then other SS NCOs, officers, people had come in on a regular basis and just basically raped them. And he had complained in his testimony uh, about the fact that their being raped at night in his custody used to keep him awake. So that's the kind of man that we're dealing with here. 
So he's a piece of work and, and he happens to drive back in just as they're about to mount their attempt to escape. As Bauer drove into the compound, he spotted one of the inmates running away from one of the dead SS officers' bodies. So he took up his weapon and began shooting. At the same time, the commander of the uh, Ukrainian guard storms into the compound, um, can't believe what he's seeing and demands to know what's going on. He was instantly killed by the inmates. So now the alarm has been raised and all of the Ukrainian guard around the perimeter know what's happening and they open fire and you have just chaos. Pachersky realised he didn't have time for all of the inmates to assemble in the compound, so he gave the order for them to run. So people went in different directions. Some headed for the main gate. Others made for the north fence, where the first ones formed a ladder of human bodies over which their comrades could clamber over the barbed wire and took the fence down. You had people running through uh, the minefield that was protecting the outer area of the camp. The people in front were basically sacrificing themselves, running over the mines, dying, so that the people behind could get over them and through to freedom. Pachewski is smart. He thinks if there's anywhere that isn't going to be protected by a minefield around it, you're not going to surround the living quarters for your SS men with mines. So he leads a group behind that building and then they make a run for it from there. So you had the inmates running in all directions, being fired on from all directions. You had total chaos in the camp. And most importantly, you had the inmates with the upper hand. Not everyone chooses to run. Some of them tried to break into the arms store, but having failed, they picked up the weapons of the dead Ukrainian guards and engaged the Ukrainians in a vicious gun battle, knowing that ultimately they would die, but intent on buying time for their comrades to escape. By the time it's over, four more Ukrainians lie dead, and about 150 insurgents have been killed by the gunfire and mine explosions. Of the 600 prisoners in the camp that day, 300 managed to escape. But it doesn't end there. Pachewski's military experience is so key because one of the things he, he has men do is cut the telephone wires so that the Germans can't call for help. And it actually takes them more than a day to mobilise and realise the extent of what's happened at the camp and send reinforcements. And by the time the camp was relieved the next day, not only were something like 300 uh, of the inmates running free, but over a third of the Ukrainian guards had also escaped. It seems that they weren't very happy either. Eventually, a search party of some 400 men, supported by three spotter planes, begins to scour the woods. The Nazis calculated that the prisoners would be moving east, heading back into Russia. So they posted patrols and swept the woods towards the Ug River. What they fail to realise is that most of the people in the camp are actually Polish. So obviously they head northwest, um, where they manage to join up with um, various units of the Polish Free Army and Freedom Fighters. Leon Feldhendler hid in the forest for several weeks, then made his way home to his town of Julkevka. There he was sheltered for a, a time by a friend and then he joined up with Jewish partisans. His ending is really sad. Um, just after Liberation Day, he was killed by some right-wing Poles, which is um, a really flat ending for someone who masterminded that escape attempt. The courage it must have taken for one person to, to stand up against the, the entire Nazi infrastructure. For one person in one camp to say, no, I'm not taking this anymore, to organize an escape committee, to actually take control of a camp, to, to organize a mass breakout. So the ability to do this, to me, is almost unimaginable. And then to be celebrated in your hometown by effectively being lynched. It's, it's really a tragedy. Only about 75 of the escapees actually try to cross the book. Among them are Alexander Pachersky and Toby Blatt. 
Pachersky's band of brothers and sisters only had four pistols and a rifle with them. He realized that 75 was too large a group to get across the River Boog, so he persuaded these people to split up into smaller groups and to attempt to cross different places at different times. And then he and eight others get across the river three days later and join the Russian resistance. Altogether, around two-thirds of the 300 escapees make it to freedom. The remaining 100 are either caught and shot or murdered by Polish locals. The Jewish escape from Sobibor is an incredible achievement. But it wasn't the only camp to witness an inmate uprising. There's another very dramatic one at Treblinka where Jewish children who were basically being used as skivvies by the camp authorities managed to get hold of weapons and pass them to the inmates who then rushed the fences. One young man had a spray tank, which he used to disinfect the guards' huts. But on that day, he'd filled the tank with gasoline and instead sprayed fire all over the 2,000-litre fuel dump of the camp, setting the entire camp on fire. And that meant anarchy and freedom. For something like 300 inmates were able to get away, and one inmate, as he was running, was shouting, hell is burning, and surely <laughs> nothing more opposite has ever been shouted. Hell is burning. The Sobibor breakout was the last straw for Heinrich Himmler. Fearful that the death camps could no longer be controlled and the Red Army would discover them on their march towards Berlin, he ordered the dismantling of the camp. Unfortunately for the people that remained, that means they were rounded up and shot. Then the Nazis raised the place to the ground and planted crops over the top to try and disguise what had happened there but there's no disguising death on that scale. The Nazis couldn't escape their crimes forever. In one of those extraordinary events that would be difficult to invent, in 1949, Gasmeister Bauer is in a German fairground, enjoying himself, when he meets two of the Sobibor escapees, who are also there, enjoying themselves. Apparently, when they walked up to him and said, you, we know who you are. He reportedly turned to them and said, how are you still alive? Bauer was arrested. He was convicted on the evidence of four inmates of Sobibor. He wasn't hung, but he was locked up for the rest of his life, and he died in prison where he belonged in 1980. The Nazi attempts to hide their crimes also ultimately failed. In 2014, archaeologists digging down uh, on the site of Sobibor found the gas chambers. Official figures estimate that between 167 and 250,000 people were murdered in these chambers by Bauer and his accomplices. Bauer himself put the figure at 350,000. Crimes on that kind of scale simply cannot be hidden forever. Himmler may have wanted to cover up the reality, but he couldn't do that. He couldn't do that because people survived. He failed to kill people off. And because such horror, such evil, simply cannot be kept a secret. There are many tales of extraordinary bravery in the Second World War, but the story of the Sobibor SKPs is in something of a league of its own. They were in a hopeless situation, yet they showed extraordinary bravery. And against all the odds, even managed to get some justice out of the situation in the end. I think it's proof, even if people think that they wouldn't be capable in some circumstances of doing things like that, that, that once your back is up against the wall, you find extra reserves of spirit and you, you don't take it lying down. These people in this place fought back. Let's remember them, let's celebrate them. Coming up, a Norwegian forest displays disturbing symptoms. It's as if all the trees have turned into zombies. A toxic secret with hideously deadly effects. Hundreds of sailors who jumped into the water were covered with this oily residue. So as these people are trying to save their lives in the sea, they're being poisoned. What is the purpose of the sinister Nazi fog?
forest full of zombies. They have just gone into a, a kind of zombie state. And a toxic chemical. They have burns, they have blisters, they have breathing difficulties, they have no idea what's happening to them. And a German battleship that can make itself disappear. You're never going to be able to spot it. Carfjord, Western Norway. Claudia Hartl, a tree expert from the University of Mainz, has just arrived for her next assignment. Claudia's there to carry out tests on the trees in the area to look at the effects of climate change. At first, it's business as normal for Claudia. She's taking samples of wood cores from the trees. But after a while, she starts to discover that some of the older trees have something very odd going on. She notices that in one of the cores that there's no growth rings around a certain period. And she looks at another core and she realises again, no growth rings. This is repeated time and time again. It's as if all the trees have stopped growing for a certain time in the same period. It seems as though all the trees in this area have just gone into a, a kind of zombie state. And there's nothing to explain it. She checks the climate records but there's no change in climate at that time. In fact, there's no reason why any of the trees should be behaving in any way other than normally. Things get even weirder when she compares the dates of the zombie trees. When she looks at the data, she realises it's at the time of the Second World War that this strange event occurs. It's, it's, it's at that point that some of the tree rings just stop and others become so small that they're almost not noticeable. So she begins to look closer. What might it have been about the war that caused the trees to stop growing? One possible line of inquiry is chemical warfare. Despite being illegal, chemical weapons were still being used during the Second World War. Even though the Geneva Protocol of 1925 specifically banned the use of chemical weapons, such as mustard gas, both sides of the war were stockpiling them because, of course, neither side trusted each other. In the Mediterranean, one particular incident of such stockpiling demonstrates just how toxic they can be. In August 1943, President Roosevelt approved the shipment of chemical weapons containing mustard gas to the Mediterranean. It wasn't thought that the Germans had the capability to bomb that ship at that time, but bomb it they did. And they destroyed it, with the result that 2,000 of these mustard gas bombs end up going into the water. Hundreds of sailors who jumped into the water to escape the burning ship were covered with this oily residue. Mustard gas bombs are leaching into the water, so as these people are trying to save their lives in the sea, they're being poisoned by the mustard gas. They picked up burns, they picked up blisters, many of them lost their eyesight. Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Francis Alexander, a US Army expert in chemical warfare, was urgently flown to the scene. Alexander instantly recognised the telltale symptoms of mustard gas. But when he raised this, he was told basically to keep his mouth shut and just to treat the survivors. And the reason was the Allies simply couldn't let it become known that they were ready to use mustard gas. If the Germans find out that the Americans are you know, stockpiling and transporting you know, chemical weapons, then they might be more tempted to use them on Americans and Allied soldiers. So this has to be kept quiet. This is just one example of toxic chemicals being spilled accidentally into the sea. The end of the previous war saw such spillage on a much more disturbing scale. At the end of the First World War, the major nations had a, a serious problem. They'd stockpiled huge amounts of chemical weapons. What on earth were they going to do with them? How were they going to dispose of them? The Soviet Union, the United States, and the United Kingdom all came to exactly the same conclusion after the war. The cheapest way to dispose of these chemical weapons was to dump them in the sea. 
this dumping was incredibly haphazard, you know, almost disorganised. You know, the chemicals were just put into containers such as old barrels, shell casings, uh, sealed up, sailed out to sea. And then this would either be dumped overboard or the entire ship would be scuttled. And there'd be very, very little in the way of records about what was dumped where. Out of sight, out of mind was basically the, the, the idea here. So it's entirely possible that a whole load of chemicals could have been dumped in this fjord. Fjords are very deep um, and then just left there and forgotten about. While this may sound far-fetched, an incident in the 1990s shows just how dangerous such substances can be. In January 1997, a Polish trawler was fishing off the Baltic coast when it pulled on board uh, an unusual object. It was a seven kilogram chunk of yellowish clay. The crew are not very clear what it is, but they didn't seem too worried about it. After all, it's just, you know, another thing at the bottom of the sea. Could be so many things. They process it, they, they chuck it in a bin. Uh, you know, they don't think much of it. The next day, the Polish crew find themselves in complete agony. They have burns, they have blisters, they have breathing difficulties. They have no idea what's happening to them. The area is shut down until military experts are brought along to see what this is, what is causing this problem. They work out that it's a solid block of sulphur mustard that's been frozen on the seabed by the low temperatures and lain there dormant for decades until the Polish crew lifted it up to the surface. This stuff is really dangerous, and even though it's been lying at the bottom of the ocean for, for years, um, it's still incredibly toxic to the human body. So it's possible that actually something at the bottom of Caffiord could have leached into the water and somehow got into the water table that the trees are drawing off at the time and stopped them from growing. Hartle thinks she's onto something, but she needs to find an agent other than mustard gas to make her theory work. Mustard gas is obviously extremely toxic to humans, but Hartle is not convinced that actually mustard gas has that same level of toxicity on trees. If you look at the effect on plants and trees on the Western Front, for example, where a huge amount of mustard gas was dropped, that those plants, those trees, don't seem to have suffered any long-term damage. It's not until one of her colleagues tells her a story about a Nazi ship that the final piece falls into place. During the Second World War, the Nazis hid this massive battleship, the Tirpitz, in uh, Norwegian fjords. The German Navy concluded that the Nordic fjords were the perfect place for the Tirpitz to hide in order to intercept shipping going to the Soviet Union. The Tirpitz, second and last battleship of the Bismarck class, was the largest warship in the German Navy. With an overall length of 823 feet, over 2,000 sailors, a main battery of eight 15-inch guns, and enough space to carry four planes. Winston Churchill called her the Beast. Now, clearly, it's not easy to hide a very large battleship, particularly when you've got Norwegian resistance actually looking out for it and ready to report uh, its existence uh, to the Allies. So they tried camouflaging it by covering it with tree trunks. But of course, you know, that might help a little, but it's not that effective because the Tirpitz was vast. You know, just chucking some logs on its decks isn't really going to help you. But then they come on an idea which does seem to work, and that is to use an enormous smoke screen. You release a cloud of chlorosulfuric acid into the air. Now, this actually holds water molecules to it, creating a kind of permanent foggy cloud. So anything flying over looking down, all it would see is a large bank of fog. Also remember that this is extremely toxic, this acid. So for the sailors who are actually putting it into practice, they would have to wear gas masks, they'd have to wear protective suits, they'd have to be very careful in the way they were deploying this extraordinary substance. However, the Nazi fog wasn't enough to protect the Tirpitz forever. On the 12th of November 1944, no less than 30 Lancaster bombers take off with one goal in mind, to sink the Tirpitz. They're equipped with these tall boy bombs. These weren't ordinary bombs. These were the bombs that were designed to bury themselves deep into armor and to explode with an enormous force. Now, during the raid, only two of those tall boy bombs hit the Tirpitz, but that's enough. It causes the hull to rupture and the Tirpitz goes down. 
but along with the tur pits and all its munitions also goes all these incredibly poisonous chemicals that were used to create this artificial fog. Looking at the war records, Hartle's trees line up with the recorded location of one of the Tirpitz's most common hiding places, Carfjord. When she looked at the very small distance between the site of these trees and an area where Tirpitz had regularly hidden, she concluded that here was the problem, that this toxic smoke had gotten into the tree when it was younger and had basically stopped it from growing. It's this poisonous fog that stopped the needles growing on these trees. And if you stop the needles growing on these types of trees, you're going to stop the trees growing. One of the trees, she noticed, hadn't grown for nine years, but eventually it started growing again normally. So you can gauge the toxicity of this extraordinary acid, of this chemical, that not only did it hide a ship from the Royal Air Force, temporarily at least, but it actually prevented trees from growing. It would appear that the Norwegian forests still bear the scars of a chemical game of cat and mouse between the Tirpitz and Allied Air Forces over 70 years later. Historians spend lifetimes examining events and wondering what the effects were, the consequences were on later generations, on our current day world. But perhaps another thing we should focus a little more on is what the actual, practical, tangible, long-term effects of war on our current environment. The ocean is, is, is a, it's the major part of our planet. And you know, if you're just dumping chemicals into it, you know, you're poisoning wildlife, you're, you're poisoning a life source. It's anyone's guess just to what extent chemical weapons have damaged the planet and it illustrates just how dangerous these weapons can be. Coming up, there's something strange in the Canadian woods. There's suddenly lights in the sky, suspicious lights in the sky, men in hazmat suits, hikers who were escorted away by government officials. It's not a weather phenomenon. Something this weird can't be good. That's effectively the mini nuke heading America's way. And the suits don't want you to know about it. Men in black, people getting whisked away in the night. This could be the opening to a Steven Spielberg film. When the war goes cold, things get even weirder. Unidentified flying objects light up the sky. What were these objects? Were they man-made? Were they extraterrestrial? Men in black and hazmat suits descend upon the area. This is something extremely, extremely unusual, and the locals are getting really suspicious. What kind of close encounter is lurking in the wilds of Canada? It's not a phenomenon that makes any sense. The whole thing kind of looks like a Spielberg movie. Twenty-fourth of January, 1978. A strange, bright fireball is spotted shooting across the sky near Slave Lake in Canada. These weird objects can be seen descending, and they're kind of casting this weird light all around them. It's not a weather phenomenon. There's no thunder or lightning nearby. This can't be explained by some weird meteorological oddity. No, this is very strange. Something big has happened. Although it's a remote area, there are locals, and they're beginning to get suspicious about the incident. It gets even stranger. Men start showing up in hazmat suits. They cordon off the entire area. Equipment comes in, weird tents go up. When a group of hikers is spotted examining a sparkling piece of metal, suddenly these men wearing kind of moon suits turn up. The men in the hazmat suit take the hikers away. All very suspicious. Men in hazmat suits, men in black, people getting whisked away in the night. Some people think, could this be aliens? News even reaches the American White House that hysteria is spreading through the area. One security advisor says we really don't need a rerun of the Mercury Theater. 
The Mercury Theater incident refers to a time in the 30s when Orson Welles read aloud a dramatization of H.G. Wells' book, The War of the Worlds. But he did it in a way as if it was sort of a docudrama, as if it was actually happening. And he was the reporter observing the aliens landing. And according to the stories, the people listening to it thought it was real and uh, were running into the streets looking for the aliens, preparing for the invasion. Now, of course, that mass panic and hysteria never really happened, but it entered into public consciousness. And so when there was some weird thing falling out of the sky, the officials were desperate to make sure that actually what had once been fake wasn't going to become real. It turns out that the government really is covering something up, but it's far more deadly than E.T. In December 1977, the North American Aerospace Defense Command began to observe erratic behaviors on the part of a Soviet satellite called Cosmos 954. It's behaving increasingly erratically and kind of changing its orbital trajectory by kind of 50 miles at a time, which is really pretty big. Um, so there's something clearly going wrong. The United States Aerospace Defense Command sent up their observations to the chain of command and tried to work out what the Soviets were up to. What they didn't know was that the Soviet Space Agency was in full panic over the fact that this satellite was about to come down out of orbit. Soviet officials warn their U.S. counterparts that they are having mechanical problems with the satellite. In the United States, the White House knew that a Soviet satellite was about to come down, uh, and they wanted the Soviet Union to provide some details about what was on that satellite. And as it turns out, there was a nuke on board. No one is supposed to be launching nukes into space, but the Soviets have been stretching the rules. The Soviets had created a system called RORSAT, which was a, effectively a reconnaissance satellite system by which they could observe the movements of ships on the high seas, and they could therefore observe the movement of US nuclear submarines. These RORSAT satellites don't have a normal power source. They're powered by onboard nuclear reactors. It turns out in Cosmos 954 that there is this reactor core that is designed to be shot off into space in the event of the spacecraft losing control. The safety system that was designed to eject the reactor and put it into a stable, safe orbit has failed. That's not just some falling bit of metal. That's effectively like a mini nuke heading America's way. The USSR finally confirms the loss of Cosmos 954 and its onboard nuclear reactor. The Soviet government reassured everyone that the satellite would burn up on re-entry. Look, this isn't going to be a problem. It's going to burn up on re-entry. You know, it's not going to be a problem. Just relax. But those reassurances weren't entirely convincing. You know what? The Americans don't feel like that. They get together everybody, you know, the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, the CIA, you name it. You know, they're in full crisis mode. This group is called NEST, the Nuclear Emergency Support Team. NEST's code word for the operation to recover the satellite was called Morning Light. The goal of which was to recover what might fall to Earth as Cosmos 954 falls out of orbit. NEST concludes that Cosmos 954's reactor contains over 100 pounds of highly enriched uranium. Now, the reactor on Cosmos 954 has been running for four months, and during that time, it's producing all sorts of radioactively nasty material, such as cesium, strontium, plutonium. You know, this isn't nice stuff, and if it falls to Earth and it's just sitting around, I mean, that can give you radiation sickness and kill you from a distance of a 1,000 feet. You don't want that anywhere near you. The impending impact of this nuclear time bomb is kept top secret, as the White House lends its nuclear expertise to the Canadian government, where the nuke will fall to Earth. The White House was concerned that the public would be thrown into a panic if they learned the details of this, especially the satellite distributed the radioactive material over a populated area. So what you're actually doing is sending off what's called a dirty bomb. You're just spreading radioactive contamination everywhere. It's a nasty thing to do, and that can cause deaths for generations. Strangely, to the government, 
a UFO cover story would be better than the actual story of a Soviet satellite coming out of orbit and distributing radioactive materials all over populated areas in the Pacific Northwest. Late in the morning of the 24th of January, 1978, a fireball is seen streaking across the northern sky. Cosmos 954 re-enters Earth's atmosphere on a trajectory that takes it over the far reaches of North America. And unlike the Soviet Union claimed, the satellite did not burn up as it re-entered the atmosphere. Instead, as it came down, it left a trail of radioactive materials. And that trail covered almost 124,000 square miles of northwestern Canada. Actually, this is one of the least densely populated parts of the entire planet. If you're going to drop this stuff anywhere, it might as well be there. Sorry, Canada. The Canadian government initiates a significant cleanup operation as it seeks to locate and then mitigate these pieces of radioactive satellite waste. One fragment was so radioactive that it was estimated to have a radiation level that was enough to kill you if you were in contact with it for just a few hours. So imagine if you were just some kid who had picked up this shiny bit of metal. You could have been dead by the time you got back from your walk. And nuclear exposure isn't the only thing to worry about. Due to the location where the satellite came down, this would have been one of the most challenging recovery operations in the history of any government. And that's because in the northern Canadian forests in winter, I think it's like minus 30, minus 40, and it's covered in snow. So imagine you're finding basically something the size of a backpack uh, that has exploded over hundreds of square kilometers. There's no GPS at this time. They're also trying to do it in near secret so as not to cause a massive public alarm and, and mass panic. The only piece of kit you've really got to help you search this radioactive material are handheld Geiger counters. But you know what? Their batteries start freezing up. They eventually recover 12 large fragments of the satellite, 10 of which were highly radioactive. But if the cleanup operation was complicated, the political repercussions proved even more taxing. In the end, the Canadian government has spent $12 million in cleaning up the debris from Cosmos 954. The Soviets refused to pay up. Uh, this started an international legal tussle over sort of uh, the obligation for a country to pay for its messes that come about from sort of failed space programs such as this. Uh, they take it to uh, international courts and it gets reduced to just a $3 million cleanup bill. That's a matter of opinion, kid. An interesting legal precedent is set by the case of Cosmos 954. Countries that launch things into space are therefore liable to clean up the mess that that object might cause when it falls back down to Earth. That makes a lot of sense to me, and actually makes me feel a lot happier when a satellite next falls on my house than I'm going to get the money back from the country that launched it. 